Dobro večer i dobrodošli na još jedno izdanje Piščevog dnevnika kojeg vodi David Albahari, naš veliki prijatelj i veliki knjižavnik kojeg on vodi još od prošle godine. I ja neću dužiti, danas ćemo pričati na engleskom pa ću se ja sada prebaciti. So, I'll switch to English now. David Albahari hosts the program Chronicle of a Writer which um, actually presents um, people um, whose uh, intellectual or um, literary work um, has um, influenced David or has, um, 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 has been, uh, let's say, um, inspir uh, inspirational for him. But uh, I won't um, go any further. I will just present to you David Albahari, and I would ask David to present his uh, guest tonight. Uh, David, will you Thank you. I was take over uh, with the microphone? I was, I was thinking of finding somebody else to introduce Mark after I introduced that person. It would be too interesting to, to, to hear several people introducing you one another until we come to, 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 the, to the final introduction. <laughs> but uh, I'll just say a few sentences. Uh, I'll actually I'll read them from, from the cover of this book. Mark Kingwell was born in 1963. He's a professor of philosophy at the University of Toronto and a contributor editor, contribu contributing editor of Harper's Magazine. He is the author of 16, I think it's more than 16. Uh, 17. 17. Of 17 previous books of political, <coughs> cultural, and aesthetic theory, including the bestsellers Better Living in 1998, The World We Want, 2000, and then the, the biography of Glenn Gould. It, it is a biography of Glenn Gould, right? Yes. It was published in two, 2009. He's also the author of Opening Gambits, 2008, and uh, The Wage Slaves Glossary with John Glenn, 2011. Mm. What, what is missing from, from, from this short introduction? Uh, well, uh, I suppose lots of things. My life, <laughs> as it's lived. Uh, but uh, the, the book you're holding is a collection of essays from 2012 called Unruly Voices, and I published last year uh, another collection of essays meant to go with that one called Measure Yourself Against the Earth. So I've been publishing a lot of essays. Uh, you actually said, uh, somewhere wrote somewhere that the essay is your favorite, favorite literary, literary form. Yeah, I think it, it, for me, I think of the essay in the tradition of Montaigne, uh, with a um, mixture of philosophical, personal, political elements and using the, the format of, of argument uh, without being strictly formal about it to investigate a, a particular subject. And it has a natural length somewhere, for me anyway, somewhere between, say, uh, six and 10,000 words, which is a, uh, in a if, if, I forget who said that the sonnet is the perfect poetic form for a single thought. Uh, the essay, I think, is the perfect prose form for a single chain of thoughts, uh, the smallest kind of contained argument. And, uh, and that's why I like it. I think that I've been able to stretch, I mean, collections of essays are one thing, but I've been able to stretch essay-like elements into chapters of a connected larger argument. But uh, all of my work, I think, is rooted in the idea of the essay as the natural form. Uh, and. Uh, you mentioned my, my book on happiness from 98, seems like uh, such a long time ago now, uh, has a lot of personal elements and that was very much uh, influenced by the Montaigne style. You use the, the self and the experience of the self and world as a vehicle of exploration of ideas. And for me that, that means that uh, it's one way to make philosophy alive for myself and for other people. Uh, uh, it's not an abstract Olympian investigation, but rather uh, an investigation uh, or, or even uh, 
not so much investigation, exploration of the particulars of one person's way of looking at the world. So you consider yourself to be a philosopher? <laughs> uh, that's what it says on my business card. Uh, but it, we were talking, Aaron and I were talking before the talk, um, before the conversation. The academic notion of the philosopher, the professor of philosophy, is clearly distinct from philosopher in a larger, maybe more interesting sense. I would like to think that in addition to being a professor of philosophy as my, my livelihood, uh, I at least aspire to be a philosopher in that, that other sense. But this is an important distinction because a lot of my colleagues in academic philosophy are not really philosophers in the sense of being interested in the world uh, in general terms or uh, certainly not interested in changing the world or making something uh, forceful in their intellectual interventions. It becomes a very self-enclosed and professional, highly professionalized, uh, institutionalized undertaking, which uh, is academic in a, in a negative sense. So I like to think that, that I, I uh, can extend beyond that, and I wish more of my colleagues did also. What, what, what would, you, would you say? What is the role of philosophy today? If, if philosophy has, has any role? Well, I'd like to think it does. Uh, my own view is, is optimistic on at least the possibility of philosophy being a critical discourse on reality and our experience of it. Uh, so much of that has to do with exposing uh, or making transparent presuppositions that everyday discourse is in the habit of covering over or disguising. Uh, and I think, so I, I, in that sense, I belong to a tradition of uh, critique of ideology, which is uh, long-standing in certain certain philosophical quarters, taking things that are taken for granted and no longer taking them for granted. That in itself is a valuable service, but it's only the first step. After that, uh, once we see maybe more clearly the presuppositions of our thoughts and actions, then and only then can we go about the business of acting more consciously, uh, being more engaged, maybe being more critical of, of the conditions of everyday life. But philosophy, as I conceive it, is essential to that two-step task. Uh, but of course, it becomes very difficult when uh, philosophy is, is seen to be marginal uh, or uh, makes itself marginal in that academic sense I mentioned a moment ago. So several decades ago, um, I think it was uh, actually uh, some people thought that uh, the main role, that the main science, so, so to speak, to, to explain to the world to, to us was or is physics. So, and uh, there were all those books by, by, by famous thinkers who, 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 uh, who claimed that, that physics is, is the most important uh, uh, branch of, of, of human knowledge. Is, 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 is physics still, still the, the, the leading? The, the, the leading science, so to speak? I would say that that, that has probably shifted over to uh, neuroscience. Uh, I think in, in contemporary terms, if you look at the, the, the explanatory discourse that gets the most attention and is taken seriously without question, uh, lately it has been neuroscience. And so if, if someone says, well, here's an MRI scan of creativity, then you can sell you know thousands and thousands of books talking about the, neuro, the MRI scans of, of creativity, or of, on the opposite side, uh, psychopathology. So uh, the, I did a, a big review essay on books about evil as conceived by, by neuroscience. So um, neuroscientists claim to be able to say, we could all do MRI scans later, and we'd be able to pick out the, the evil ones in the crowd uh, just by their brain scans. Uh, and th this, is, this is something I think is, is there's the science, and then there is the cultural appropriation or acceptance of the science, and the two things are not the same. Uh, scientism, the, the notion of scientism, is the idea that a single scientific discourse must be the master discourse, and I think philosophy must be opposed to this because there is no master discourse, and yet the cultural take up, uh, the, the sort of traction, cultural traction that uh, the discourse of neuroscience gets, or physics got in another uh, moment, 
uh, tends to go into this mastery position. And this is very dangerous because, uh, it, you know, the explanatory power of MRI scans is actually quite limited. It really tells us nothing about the human experience. It tells us nothing about selfhood, about desire. Uh, so it's a false explanation in, in the sense that it dominates and pretends to be a, a comprehensive one, when its explanatory <coughs> power, while real, is only very narrow. Uh, so I think this, you know, this is one of the things that philosophy can do, is, is say, look, that isn't a master discourse, and we should be vigilant uh, about the way that it creeps into a cultural conversation as if it were the explanation of everything. But how, how, how can philosophy reach the, 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 the wider audience? Well, you know, it's, uh, what? I, it has to speak. Uh, it has to find ways of speaking. This is part of the problem with philosophy that uh, has, has become professionalized, institutionalized. The, uh, the jargon of philosophy has become a kind of armor against comprehension. So that uh, people set up, sort of surround, uh, which, which repels any potential outside interest. So if you're, you're inside that, it feels very safe because you're only talking to other people who are protected in exactly the same way. Uh, the responsibility then is on philosophers to turn that around and take the armor off and say, well, you know, I'm going to speak uh, in a different way. I'm going to speak in, in newspaper articles or magazine articles. I'm going to go on the radio or television uh, or speak to general audiences and actually make an effort to make the ideas that, that animate me uh, alive for other people who don't already agree and don't already talk the same language. This is a tremendous responsibility. I, it's, it's no surprise that a lot of people don't take it up because it's quite difficult. Also, I should say, this is a small point, but important. Uh, you will be punished for doing that by the people who are inside the armor. How, how would you well, they, they, they won't take you seriously as, as a philosopher if you start talking. You know, you get the dreaded label of popularizer. And I've gone through many waves of this over the course of my career, that, that somehow wanting to speak to a wider audience is actually uh, is bad or harmful, which seems to me entirely, uh, not only counterintuitive, but dangerous. Uh, so th this is a, a perversity within the academic version of philosophy, that somehow efforts to be more uh, communicative are viewed with hostility, suspicion, even contempt. Is it, I'm, I'm, I'm dying to ask you about uh, Bart Simpson in, 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 in your essays, about the appearance of Bart Simpson in, in your essays and then Lisa Simpson. And uh, of course, uh, Star Trek are also mentioned, I think, quite quite often. Yes. But uh, we, should, we should talk about some things that are considered to be more serious. More serious. I will say I'm going to talk about Bart and Lisa and Homer Simpson on Friday's lecture at MAMA. So. If anybody wants to talk about The Simpsons, though, we can do that then. Are they so, so important in your life? Well, uh, it, not in themselves. I think it's, it's more that uh, popular culture is culture. It's the culture of our experience. And the lessons that are embedded in it, both the ones that are obvious and the ones that are hidden, are, are part of what we need to understand. Uh, so it's a, it's a it's, it's no different from talking about literature, examples from, from you know, famous classical literature. Uh, television is, is the, the, the cultural vernacular of our, of our time, and uh, we ignore it at our peril. So uh, it's not that Lisa, well, Lisa is actually kind of important to me. She's the role model. Um, but it's more the example that, that these characters pose and how we can make sense of them that I find illuminating. In this book of essays, uh, you write a lot about the end of the, the, the democracy. Well, why do you think it's, it's uh, the, you mean this, this period we, 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 we now live in? You see that the, the end of the democracy? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, in important ways. Um, you will know that, um, as I mentioned, in 2012, this book was published. And uh, like most people, I didn't anticipate what would happen to political discourse in, in the United States in the years between 2012 and now. Uh, but uh, all of the things that have happened have, have made our worries about the health of democracy even more acute. Uh, and, you know, Mr. Trump's 
notion of democracy and of political discourse is uh, at once highly successful and and highly dangerous uh, because the, this is it's not just that it's populism populism has always been part of democratic discourse but it's it's actually in in a in a bad sense postmodern there is no regard for truth or accountability uh, and the appeal to the, the, the alleged democratic appeal is, is actually a kind of um, devilish, devilish inversion of the, the genuine appeal, which is supposed to be, you know, democracy is supposed to be each one counts for one. And of course, that isn't true in any actual democracy that's ever existed. Uh, but, but what's happened in the United States and frankly in other uh, developed nations, uh, alleged democracies, is a constant uh, toxic uh, disease within that democratic discourse. And the only hope that we can hold out, I think, is a very slim one, is that there's still a vestige of critical possibility within democratic discourse that can be uh, held onto, that we can hold onto. Uh, but it's a, it's a, a very slim hope. Uh, you know, I don't want to be too cynical, but uh, you we want to be <laughs> But I mean, this, isn't, this is not news to anybody. You know, look at any alleged de democracy and uh, we see that the death throes of a once noble idea. So, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm not in despair about this. Or, or maybe it's a kind of cheerful despair, uh, if that makes sense. Um, that we theorize under conditions of, of near apocalypse. And uh, there's, there's a, you know, an, an urgency to that. You, you, you've written somewhere in, in this book that it may be that every generation imagines its political challenges are uniquely difficult. I see four factors that, if not unique, make for the special set of challenges we now face in democratic, democratic politics. They are wealth inequality, asymmetrical polarization, distrust of government, and empathy deficit. Could you, could you say something about, about these, these four? Um, Topics. Yeah, so uh, I mean, to take the general point first, it, it is a recurring tendency within all cultural discourse to imagine that the present moment is the worst possible moment that's happened in the history of the world. So it, it, it isn't? <laughs> I think it is. But uh, how could I think otherwise? Because uh, that, that's what, what we need to think. But if you look at the historical record, it's, it's, it's interesting and, and maybe uh, <coughs> instructive to see that if you go back to obviously any point in the 20th century, but any point in the 19th, the 18th, the 17th, go back to 500 years before the Common Era, uh, the, the ancient uh, Athenians were complaining about the bad manners of the youth and how they, they were too loud and they ate all the food at parties and you know, they were, they were uh, uncivil. So this, their version of, of us complain, well, I, this is a younger audience that I'm usually talking to, but um, I, I complain about my students you know, staring at their phones. So it's the same thing as, you know, the Athenians complaining about the, the unruly youth. But having said that, uh, there are material conditions which are unique to our moment that, have, that are unprecedented. Uh, the combination of neoliberal capitalism and its potential to generate ongoing and increasingly worse wealth inequalities is unprecedented. Uh, and at the same time though, those wealth inequalities are not generating political consciousness that's effective. And there are exceptions. Occupy is, is one exception. But like many people, I think I was uh, ambivalent, let's say, ambivalent maybe on shading into disappointed about the ongoing effects of, of Occupy. Even though there are some important material things. Uh, this is a footnote, but an important one. There's a, been a great deal uh, in Rolling Jubilee, which was a, an Occupy uh, uh, shoot, offshoot to forgive student debt in the United States, and other, other kinds of debt. So tremendous amounts of debt, hundreds of thousands of dollars racked up by individuals pursuing a, a university education. Rolling Jubilee has actually bought that debt at discount and forgiven it, uh, which is a straightforward material economic intervention. It's the kind of thing other, other agencies could buy discounted debt too, uh, but not forgive it. <laughs> That's what was happening. So Rolling Jubilee has actually had a practical effect in that sort of um, uh, respect. But has it changed the political culture of the United States or, or uh, anywhere else? Not very much. 
So th this is one important thing, the, the wealth inequality generation. Uh, the, the nature of political consciousness, I think, has changed too. Uh, Mr. Trump is tapping into a particular form of anger or resentment, but in a way that, that is not respectful of, not constructive to uh, political culture more generally. So that, that's not unprecedented either, but it has a, a very uh, particular form in the current circumstance. Uh, so those, those are at least two of the four that I mentioned there. Yeah, uh, uh, just to uh, bring the story for, um, closer home, you are uh, talking about the United States, but uh, there are examples, uh, a failed one and uh, almost successful one in Europe. So we are talking about Greece and Spain, where Occupy or Indignados uh, actually turned into a kind of a political shift within the country. and. Uh, at the same time, and we are still not sure where it's going because um, obviously some cities were taken, like Barcelona, but uh, not the whole country. And uh, the other example is uh, Greece with the Syriza and their failure, basically, to kind of rise up to the EU expectations, but also to, to change the paradigm within the EU. So can you comment on that? So uh, this is a big, big topic or set of topics. Um, part of I think part of what's happened in uh, this is the perspective of someone who's not European, but as we watch what's happened in Europe, uh, there are multiple causes of, of things. But uh, to my mind, one of the, the key pieces is the constant return to uh, the false idea that austerity economics will, will solve any of these problems. And we know that this is not true. Uh, every time it's been attempted, austerity has, has backfired uh, in terms of, of a rescue of uh, the economic situation. And along the way has generated a great deal of misery. And, and yet the economic thinking is stuck. Uh, so there's a, a complete failure, it seems to me, of creative solutions to these economic problems. Uh, at the same time, and, and sort of in back of that, uh, within Europe, there is, uh, I don't have to tell you, guys, uh, the, the kind of um, power struggles or imbalances where, uh, you know, which themselves are driven by economic status, uh, generate relationships that, that are toxic. So between Germany and Greece, for example, uh, has, has become a kind of toxic relationship all by itself. It's like a, you know, something that needs marriage counseling, but there's no counselor, you know. Uh, so I mean, this is part of what I see going on, and and around that, I mean, again, this is this is your immediate experience. Something that that in North America we only watch on the news, uh, the the refugee crisis, and what that has meant to uh, the population of, of various countries in Europe, and very alarming to me, and I, I imagine to many people, the rise of uh, extreme right, nationalist, uh, ethnic, uh, uh, exclusionist. Uh, political movements and parties, not just movements in the sense of, you know, street gangs or cults, but actual parties running for election and getting into power. So, they, they, you know, it's a very, very uh, volatile situation. And I don't think there's anyone, certainly not the United States, in a position to adjudicate or, or uh, heal these kinds of, of uh, toxic relationships. So, the, you know, this is very, very worrying. Uh, I don't know if I have anything more insightful to say about this, except I'm worried, you know, like most people who pay attention. I thought you wanted to ask more questions. No, 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 I was late. Well, I just, I just read two, two, two or no, three uh, short segments where we, we mentioned writing and fiction and compare it in, in a certain way to philosophy. <coughs> First, you say the reason philosophy is not literature is that philosophy, whatever else it does, and in whatever style, makes truth claims. And that is precisely what literature does not and cannot do. You want me to comment on that? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> uh, I should say first that that, uh, that statement or those statements are embedded in a larger argument about the nature of. of literary truthfulness. Uh, so I think we're familiar, most people are familiar with, you, you see it quoted by, or attributed to uh, Picasso, various other people, you know, uh, 
Art is the lie that tells the truth. And so both parts are, are important. The lie in the sense that whatever is happening in art, whether it's you know, uh, pictorial, imagistic, or uh, prose fiction, po poetic fiction, uh, is not making a claim about the world that's meant to be redeemed in terms of its factual accuracy. At the same time, we recognize that under those conditions, and maybe especially under those conditions, certain kinds of, of insights or claims can be made. But they're always made implicitly or bracketed yet under the, the I mean, this, this is the nature of art, that it, there is a kind of um, <clears throat> bracket around it. Uh, it doesn't itself attempt to speak the truth in an empirical sense. That's part of what makes it able to, to offer us the possibility of insight. Uh, philosophy, I think, by, by uh, contrast, actually tries, or should try, to make claims that are redeemable in the world of, of facts. Uh, and, and as I pointed out, or I meant to in, in, emphasize there, even when uh, philosophy is being done by somebody like me, who isn't always writing in a strictly formal or, or academic mode. So I might use narrative elements, for example, but they're not fictional in the sense that I'm not inviting the suspension of disbelief. I actually want you to continue to disbelieve unless and until uh, I have convinced you that, that what I've said is correct. Uh, and that's just a different way of going on. It's not, I don't mean to imply a value judgment that philosophy or literature is better than the other. So I, I can rest assured that you don't think that philosophy is better than a fiction. <laughs> No, I don't. No. Okay. Uh, no. I'm going to say no. no. Uh, well, well but I became worried, so to speak, because I thought for a while maybe I'm not writing about the real world at all. Are you not? I'm not. I knew that everybody is the product of my imagination, but I didn't think that it, it, it would come out so soon. <laughs> and there's, there's another. Another sh short paragraph about the writers. You know all the cliches about writers already, mainly because writers love to write about themselves and each other. You know that writers are a sorry bunch, vain and touchy and bitter. You know they see it with schadenfreude. And you know it doesn't really matter how acclaimed or successful a given writer is. It was Gore Vidal, a writer of early success and high earnings, who once said, oh, this is really terrible that when a friend of his succeeds, something inside him dies. <laughs> this is really, but he, he's, he's known for, for, for such remarks, I mean. Yes. The, 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 this, this is really terrible, I mean. Uh, it, didn't, it, it never happened to me, but maybe I, I can try. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it is a great quotation. It's irresistible in a way. But uh, nobody, <clears throat> certainly no writer should model uh, herself or himself on Gore Vidal in terms of, of attitude. Uh, he's, he's a particularly nasty case. Wonderful writer, I think, but uh, nevertheless, there is something in this. We were talking about this last night a bit, that uh, all of my friends who are poets uh, don't read any other people who write poetry. In fact, they don't read any poetry at all. Uh, they spend all of their time on Twitter complaining about other poets, and, um, and especially complaining about the prizes that other poets win. So, if a poet wins a prize, then you can be guaranteed that there is a long Twitter conversation immediately initiated about why that poet should not have won the prize, maybe why the prize shouldn't exist at all. Uh, and, and, you know, this, this is the, the lifeblood of, of uh, the poetic community. Uh, I, I would say my own experience has been, and maybe it's because uh, I have many colleagues in philosophy, but only a few friends. Most of my friends are writers who are not philosophers. And I find them very good company for me because I'm not competing with them directly. And so they can make room for uh, being nice to me without worrying too much that I'm going to win the prizes that they want, even though they deny the prize should exist in the first place. I will read now a, a short segment from, a, uh, from a, uh, an article published sometime maybe a couple of weeks ago in The Economist, because it, it, will, it, will, it will be a, a good way to introduce the topic of, uh, of contemporary media, um, 
mass media and Twitter and, and uh, Facebook and what, what, all those other things. So, so here it goes. These are tough times for gatekeepers, for those who claim a certain expertise paid to pass judgment. The oracular voice of authority is being drowned out by the aggregated voice of the everyman. The voice of the scholar dethroned by the anonymous Wikipedia contributor. His assessments of quality are increasingly crowdsourced through the Facebook like button, the Yelp review, and algorithms predicting pre preferences based on previous purchases. The professional critic is marginalized, is at best irrelevant, and at worst, the embodiment of an elitist and un undemocratic pat pat patriarchy. Yeah, um, I don't know about that. Uh, I think you hear a lot of things of that kind. You hear a lot of that sort of rhetoric. Uh, again, I'm inclined to historicize these claims a little bit. So, uh, if you go back to the 18th century, say uh, David Hume writes his essay on the standard of taste, uh, and he says exactly the same thing. He says there is no privileged access to the judgment of taste. Kant was wrong, uh, he, would, he was going to be wrong. Uh, the people who, who predate Kant were wrong in thinking that rationality of a certain kind gave you privileged access to, to authority with respect to taste. Taste is, for Hume, is a matter of what we would today call crowdsourcing. And if there is a critic, all a critic is is someone who has a certain kind of voice in articulating. I, I don't even want to say standard anymore, uh, a vision of taste. Um, so th this has been around for a long time. Uh, it's true that, that if you look at it in, in shorter historical terms, after the Second World War, there was a kind of consolidation of a certain sort of influence through publications, mainstream publications like magazines and newspapers of cultural authority. And that, that was technologically based, of course, because it was, it was print technology and it was broadcast technology. So that absolutely has changed because the broadcast model no longer is the norm. But in terms of the actual intellectual content or the, the flow of ideas, uh, really not that much has changed because it is still the case that someone who is articulate, who has a voice and a vision, will be the person who rises through the noise. And maybe there's more noise or it's easier to be part of the noise. Uh, it doesn't matter because the, the, the voice and the vision, as I put it, is still the, the primary thing. So this, this uh, I think this is important to, to, to think through because there was a, a time not so long ago when we thought that these technological changes in media were democratic. So this was a great uh, promise of, of uh, non-broadcast media, that somehow everybody would get to be an expert, everybody would get to be a critic. But this has proven not to be the case at all. Uh, sure, it's easy to start your own blog, but uh, or whatever, Twitter feed, uh, Instagram, but the, the things that are, are visited are still the ones that, that uh, pull the largest audience, and that, that is the only kind of democratization that, that matters here. But that's been true for a long time. So uh, I don't worry too much about this. It seems to me that uh, this, this sort of, it's very typical of The Economist, I, I should say, <laughs> to say it in that, that sort of way. Uh, but I don't, I don't think it's accurate to our experience of our own uh, participation in culture. It's not like... So you, you are not afraid that the people will stop reading the books? Well, I, I can't stop them. If they do, uh, I hope they will continue to read books. Um, but it, it, you know, no, I'm not worried about it. Uh, more books are being published now than ever before. Uh, they find their audience or they don't. That's, that's always been the bargain. It's, it's the, the condition of, of public discourse. Uh, I think the, the, maybe, maybe it can be a little more precise about this. The aura of expertise was always an illusion. It was an illusion that was institutionally maintained or has been institutionally maintained for very short periods of time, historically speaking, in very specific circumstances. But it's always a very, very dubious and fragile property. So we're just going through our own particular version of, of a shakedown with respect to that illusion.
Well, um, I will switch to from this now. Uh, it's easy to to criticize the youth uh, type of uh, discourse to to the education system of which you also write a lot and you criticize it a lot. And um, I think what you are saying now is uh, extremely connect connected to uh, liberal arts uh, as you see them as and and as they as they are now or as. Uh, the tendencies um, now to, to kind of uh, put them more into the market and to uh, put them more into an economical framework. So can you can you connect to that and yeah. maybe discuss that? The, the, the two, I think the two uh, topics are intimately related because the if I if I may go back just as half step, the the educational version of the economist quotation that David uh, just read would be something like. Uh, Universities have to be more technologically uh, immersive. The lecture is over because it's a broadcast model. Uh, university professors, if they're not being innovate, innovative, uh, are, are going to put themselves out of business. You know, we hear this kind of rhetoric all the time. Uh, and this is, this is just very unsubtle and uh, flat-footed uh, discourse about the nature of education. Some lectures are good, some lectures are bad. The lecture as a, as a model itself is, is completely viable, just like the book is still viable as a, model, as a technology, if you like. <clears throat> so the idea that we all have to stop lecturing and become, I don't know, or be, uh, conduct uh, philosophical discussion in universities by Twitter or something like that, or whatever, the, you know, this, is, this is nonsensical and distracting. What's really important is what you said. Uh, what's really important is the way that Educational institutions are now being judged by uh, the, the normative terms of, of neoliberal economics, and, and in particular, a very narrow instrumental conception of what education is. And of course, you see this already in, uh, I don't know what the universities are like in, in Croatia, but in, in my country, certainly in the United States and parts of Europe, uh, universities are, have put themselves, allowed themselves to be put on a kind of customer service model. So the students come in, and their, their presupposition already is that the purpose of a university education is to get a job. And so whether they inherited this idea from their parents or from the culture at large, this is their presupposition. And so they judge not only the institution, but also their own choices and their own participation within it according to that, that criterion. So if it's not useful in that sense, getting a job, then it somehow it's, it's not worth anything at all. This is, this is a very dangerous confusion between uh, a certain kind of use and value as such. Uh, and we've allowed it to happen. Uh, philosophers, uh, ordinary citizens, everybody's allowed the notion of value to shrink to this instrumental idea of use. And to go back, you know, philosophical insight about this is, is as ancient as, as in the Western tradition as, as Aristotle. Aristotle says in the ethics, what is the use of use? In other words, uh, what is the notion of usefulness that you already have in your mind by which you are judging whether or not something is worthwhile or worth doing uh, or worth funding? And that's what needs to be questioned. Because yeah, it's easy to say, if I have this narrow instrumental notion of usefulness, this department in, I don't know, uh, Near Eastern Studies only employs five people only has classes with 10 or 15 people in it. Cut it from the books. Or at the same time, philosophy or English or some of the traditional humanistic subjects uh, feel the pinch, so they try to reform themselves and say, no, no, actually we are useful. Don't cut us because we get our graduates into law school or something of like that. Both of these things are very bad. Uh, the first is obviously bad. The second is kind of inheriting or internalizing the badness. It's like, well, if, if we want to defend ourselves, we have to adopt the language of the overlord. You know, I, for one, welcome our, our you know, neoliberal overlords because uh, I want to survive. You know, this, this is a terrible uh, thing for people to do because you completely erase the possibility of not just resistance, but of any other way of thinking. And traditionally, the humanities, not only the humanities, but the humanities have been the place where other ways of thinking importantly are gestated. And you lose that, you lose everything. So you're giving the game away if you start judging yourself according to that scale of value. 
And your answer to, to the question of uh, what what's the use of the higher education or whatever liberal arts in particular um, is critical thinking. So that that's your argument against neoliberal uh, type of invasion into the universities. Maybe you can say a bit more about what you mean by critical thinking yeah. and why is it important? Yeah. So it, that's the critical thinking is important, but I want to say more in the sense that uh, it's. Uh, it's not just critical thinking as part of some kind of uh, toolkit of personal success. <laughs> this is part of the bad thing I just mentioned a minute ago, right? So uh, you will become a better critical thinker if you take my logic course, and then that will get you into law school or you know get you uh, some kind of uh, job that, that prizes a certain sort of analytical ability. That's the wrong argument. Right? The, the value of critical thinking is that it, it makes you a better citizen a better person, and therefore, in the ideal case, makes for a, a better society. And I mean, this is, this is the traditional defense of, of humanities education that goes back centuries. Uh, it's, it's traditional in that sense, but it's also you know, alive, because uh, critical thinking, yes, it's a skill, but the skill has to, to, to do with uh, how it is uh, applied within social and political life. It's not just about my personal success, it's about my ability to engage in a political discourse, political and social discourse, which actually has a larger goal than just my own success. So we're, I think we're losing that. Uh, and that's the, that's the thing. So it, it, uh, to repeat myself, I guess, uh, it's not just critical thinking as such, as just neutral with respect to the project. I learn the tools of logic in order to argue whatever I want. No, that's sophistry. It's critical thinking on the way to, or in the service of, a larger social and political end. You said that we'll hear, we'll hear about uh, Lisa Simpson on Friday, yes. when you give your lecture. But I want to ask you something else. Do you listen to rock and roll music? <laughs> I, I guess it depends what you mean by rock and roll. Um, you know, I don't know. Very excited about the new Radiohead album. I listen to a lot of, of uh, 80s music. I'm sort of stuck in the 80s. Uh, I'm, I'm probably not alone in my, my age group being there. I listen to a lot of, uh, like, you know, The Cure, The Clash. We were talking about The Clash last night. I, I listen to The Clash a lot. I guess that, that's definitely rock and roll. Well, that definitely is. Uh, I agree. But do you listen to, to what uh, Canada has to offer to the, to the world of rock and roll? Do, 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 have we have heard any of the really, really new Canadian groups or, or singers? Yeah, I mean, we were talking about No Means No last night. I forget, where's uh, Luca? Is Luca here? Yeah, so No Means No is one of his favorites. Uh, as, long as, as long as there's no Nickelback, I'm fine. Uh, <laughs> it, it, once the Nickelback is in play, I feel like I have to fail. Yeah, ni 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 nickelback, like everything coming from Alberta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not everything from Alberta is bad. <laughs> well, I'm the one who is not bad, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I'm also, I, I, speaking more Canadian, I'm a big fan of the Tragically Hip, uh, great Canadian band. And, uh, so I think that uh, they should be greater than, than they really are. But, yeah. but their, their problem, so to speak, is that they sing about Canadian topics. Yeah. And uh, these songs just mean nothing to, to, to larger North American audience. Yeah, although they should. I mean, they, like all art, it transcends the, the specifics to, to speak to larger themes. But uh, I understand there's a... Uh, um, this band is from a, a city in, in Ontario called Kingston, which has a university, but otherwise is a very provincial city. So it's all... Uh, um, it's kind of circumscribed by its, its concerns, and they have a bit of that. I learned a lot about hockey by listening to their songs. Yeah. Because yeah. they mention different hockey players and uh, different uh, famous moments in the, in the history of hockey in Canada. Yes. So. Yeah. Well, uh, and anybody who wants to ask a, 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 a question, Mark, Mark said that he would he would answer all the questions we have to ask. Well, I, 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 I'll, I'll speak <laughs> after you ask the question. I can't say I will answer the question.
Um, I would like to talk a bit about political consciousness. Political consciousness of whom and what do you mean? How do you see this? That's a great question. Uh, I've been talking um, maybe uh, critically about uh, nations, nation states. Uh, but I, I, I'm one of those people who believes that political consciousness actually is larger than, than, than a nation state, even though political discourse tends to focus uh, or limit itself to national issues. Uh, and we're still bound by this, this um, legacy of, of the past few centuries of splitting the world. I mean, again, you know this better than most people, splitting the world up into nations. Uh, I would like, I mean, I'm, I'm an old fashioned internationalist about, about politics. I would like to think that there are, there are transcendent possibilities of political consciousness. Uh, more specifically than that, what I mean is, um, you know, it, it is the, the parts of shared life having to do with how we get along with each other. And even, even a, a, a refusal, a, a, an apparent refusal of the political is a political, is a form of political consciousness. The people who say, I have no interest in politics, that is a political position. So anything that has to do with, with shared life, and that includes things like the distinctions between the public and the private. The distinction between public and private is itself a public matter, because it is the argument about the nature of the mind. Uh, all of that is political in the sense that I mean. So it's much larger than just electoral politics, even though that tends to be the focus when, you know, when it's covered in journalism. I should add, one of the things that is so uh, bizarre and, and sort of wonderful about the United States is that the focus on electoral politics is is now virtually constant, even though the, the you know the uh, presidential, senatorial, and, and uh, other cycles are supposed to go in two or four year spans. It's virtually constant. So you mentioned hockey. Hockey now the the National Hockey League season is almost twelve months a year. I think it's like nine and a half months. From, from start, to playoffs are on now. They won't end until June. So this is, you know, the, the uh, taking the professionalization of a sport, a winter sport, to an absurd level. But the same thing has happened in American politics where it's, it's virtually 12 months a year. So that, that's distracting because it becomes like watching a horse race. And it's very, you know, it's very interesting to see there was a primary in West Virginia yesterday, uh, who wins, who loses, uh, but these things are really just sideshows or spectacles that, that uh, can have the effect and often do have the effect of taking us away from the, the more, I, I think, more basic notion of political discourse, which is how, do, how are we relating to each other? What are the, what are the norms, uh, both institutional and non-institutional, formal and informal, of our relations to each other? I mean, that, that's politics. Again, it's in Aristotle. That's, that's what politics is. How do we get along with each other? Or not get along? Yeah, and uh, I really enjoyed your comments about, uh, about Trump, but uh, um, I, I think that um, sort of Trump is, uh, is a more convenient target, and, is, and I, would, I would characterize him as the variable production of, um, of political parties and candidates like for, uh, the, uh, his, his opponent, who, I mean, over 40 years has engaged in subterfuge, obfuscation, lies, outright corruption um, for pecuniary gain. I mean, uh, and it's and it's so obvious and it's so prevalent, and that basically this this 12 month, 12 month long cycle, uh, which is really a horse race that never ends, is a sort of a continuous process of vandalization, which basically you get Trump. That's what you. That's state. That's the last stage. Uh, and I, I was just wondering if you, if you agree with that characterization. Yeah, I don't think that's wrong at all. I think that that's insightful. Um, there is a sense in which uh, Trump is, is the, the boogeyman that we dreamed in our nightmares and now has come into reality. You know, it's the, the natural byproduct or retroactive uh, creation of, of the devil of this process. So you're right, it, it, focusing on him as him is I think not not very helpful. That's why uh, it's so bad that that some of the American news outlets, not just the American, I should say, but in particular CNN, uh, have been drawn into a kind of inadvertent press agent role 
in respect of the Trump candidacy because they can't help themselves. It's, it's a compulsive behavior to cover with, with apparent uh, disgust or, or dismay what's going on, and yet it just keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. So what's lacking there, to go back to a much earlier point, what's lacking there is, is any sort of analysis that can get beyond that or beneath that to the presuppositions of, of this emergent property we call Trump. I mean, he's less a person than a kind of, um, what? A kind media of, construct. Yeah, media construct, uh, uh, spectacular agent, you know? Uh, and and this, is, this is really something that needs further analysis. But every time somebody tries to do it, at least in the mass media, or what we, we used to call the mass media, mainstream media, uh, it just gets folded into to, uh, this continuous kind of um, attention upon, um, upon the person rather than the structural analysis, which, which I think we really need. So it's difficult, I mean, I've tried it myself to, I, I resist it in my, my usual uh, uh, venues, like the, the Globe and Mail newspaper in Toronto where I write frequently, I try to stay away from Trump because I don't want to become one of these press agents for, for this, right? Uh, at the same time, the, the larger structural uh, condition needs to be analyzed. So it's, it's a very tricky thing to, to find the right point of intervention. Uh, this is, I, that is always true, but this is a particularly difficult case. Yes? Would you say that Trump kind of represents, in a way, kind of a reaction to the neoliberalism that's so, in, in some kind of ironic way, it's, I just think that, you know, when you look at the two different candidates, <coughs> like Bernie Sanders and Trump, of course they stand on total polar opposite sides of political spectrum in many ways, but, you know, is, is, is he one of the ways that, you know, America's reacting to kind of this late you know? I think in order to, uh, to agree with that, I would have to, I'd have to think hard about what kind of irony that is. You said some kind of ironic way. Um, that, that is certainly a very perverse irony, uh, if true. There, but there is, there is a, an important grain of truth in that, and that, that has to do with uh, disenfranchisement, uh, which is a direct material consequence of neoliberalism. For example, I mean, this is, is, has been well documented, uh, the moving offshore of blue collar work from, from most of North America because of exploitation of cheap labor elsewhere, especially in Asia, has created a kind of underclass of people who, in previous eras, would have, would have had that blue collar work at livable wages. And this is one of the, one of those curious points where Sanders and Trump actually are on the same page. Actually, there's a little bit of overlap. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the difference, of course, is that that uh, Trump has managed to tap into anger and almost, in some cases, violence in respect of that disenfranchisement. And that, that is the dangerous part. You know, that calling attention to the disenfranchisement and taking it seriously politically, that seems to me a very important and good thing to do. Uh, but to exploit it, especially when the person doing the exploitation is you know, a multi-billionaire uh, who is not the self-made man he claims to be, but in, ha in fact inherited his wealth and has been a, uh, a hack, uh, you know, a hack of capitalism his entire life, you know, a happy hack. Hawking steak knives and, and uh, reality television. Uh, that there's your irony. I mean, that's that's a cosmic irony. That's an irony of a, a kind of um, you know. That's an irony to pre to, to please somebody like uh, Michelle Ulibek or uh, Ian Chirin. You know, this is an irony that makes you want to kill yourself. That, that's that kind of irony. Mm. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, I see Luca. Uh, so you read about happiness, and uh, I don't know what you wrote, but uh, I have a, uh, I have a impression that uh, people have never been so obsessed with you know pursuit of their personal happiness and uh, happiness as such, and it's not really making them happy. So has it always been like this? You know, the concept of happiness was it always this important in, in society? No, certainly not. Uh, that that is easily documented. That wasn't. I'm going to talk more about this on Friday also. Uh, in a way, I, I, just to explain that the lecture on Friday is um, an attempt in a way to update the, my thinking about happiness in the years since the, my, my book on happiness was published. So that's now almost 20 years, 18 years. And a lot has, has happened, especially with respect to uh, technology in those uh, almost two decades. 
but the general question, no. The, 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 notion, the notion not only that we should be happy, but that we must be happy is of very recent origin. And uh, it's the must that I think is most uh, interesting. You know? uh, that, that somehow you are rated a failure if you are not able to achieve happiness. Because look, we gave you all of these directives about how to do it, and yet you, you keep failing. Well, that must be your problem, not our problem. And people, people, you know, they believe that. They look around and they think that everyone else is happy except them, which is, you know, again, demonstrably not true. Uh, so th this, this itself becomes, starts as a good thing, you know. How could you say, well, hmm, what's wrong with happiness, surely? No, but, but the notion of, of happiness, uh, not just the particular visions of material success, bourgeois comfort, but the very idea, the normativity that surrounds it, these things are, are, uh, are very, very pathological. And they need, they need to be analyzed and, and diagnosed so that we can free ourselves in a way from happiness. So we can be happiness delinquents. There's Lisa Simpson. Lisa Simpson is a happiness delinquent. She knows that she doesn't fit in, in the, you know, the cultural surround. And she makes her way anyway. Uh, it's difficult. It's uncomfortable. But, but this is a necessary position to take up as a subject, uh, not to uh, succumb to the normativity of, of the happiness project. So, uh, yeah, this is my wish that more people would reject happiness and become happiness delinquents. Uh, it's, it's not quite, you know, de Gaulle said famously, happiness is for idiots. Uh, <laughs> maybe too cynical. Uh, but let's, let's put it more, dif uh, more uh, diplomatically, right? Uh, happiness is a spectacle. Uh, and it, it, like any spectacle, it needs to be dismantled. I'm just here now. <laughs> <laughs> At the back, yes. Yeah, if I may uh, uh, change a little bit the subject uh, or bring it to education as such. And uh, I'm just reminded you mentioned philosophy and uh, sort of different literature and so on. Uh, today in the New York Times, there is an article which I found uh, very, very interesting uh, in the opinion <coughs> section, even, <laughs> not art section, where somebody writes, uh, some philosophers actually how the education of philosophy has been very European and American-centered, Western-centered, and not including the other cultures, the Eastern cultures, and how they have argued about this, but nothing happened really much enough, hardly anything happened. And so what they say, we are not even going to repeat that. Instead, we are going to say that philosophy department should be renamed in the West. Uh, this is European and American philosophy department. <laughs> and not the comparative, let's say, literature or something like that, the comparative philosophy. Um, so I find this interesting and perhaps also this uh, tremendous uh, educational control all over the world of the Western style, really, and including philosophy, which is really sort of thinking of, of so many <laughs> things. It has been, I think, also degraded because of this uh, such a self-centered, you know, it's not a dialogue, it's, 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 it's uh, so I'm just interested, what would you think of that uh, claim of the philosophy being so limited in a sense um, in the West? It, I, I think in, in general I agree there's, there has been a tremendous uh, blindness with respect to the specific historical origin of what has now come to dominate academic philosophy. And, and I try, whenever I say something, if I say, well, at least since Aristotle, I always try to say in the Western tradition, uh, for example, because, and I, I do teach other traditions, you, you can find not just similar lessons, but more searching lessons in the work, say, of Lao Tzu uh, and other Eastern philosophers. But they're just less familiar uh, to many people and, and certainly to my students. So I, I take that as a challenge as an educator. I'm blessed because the, the, the philosophy department that I belong to has a strong uh, basis in Chinese philosophy, various kinds. Uh, but we're, we're almost uh, unique in North America in that respect. And uh, it, is, it is certainly the case that the mainstream of academic philosophy is Western. So I, in a way, I applaud this measure because uh, it, it, the first step to acknowledging that is, is 
not pretending anymore to universalism and acknowledging the particular historical root series of accidents, you know, historical accidents uh, that have allowed this to happen. And it's more than just the, the history, it's also the ways of thinking. So instrumentalism, right? instrumentalism as such is a very Western idea. And it runs through the, not just the, you know, the economic thinking, but through the philosophical and social thinking right from the start. Political or what's happening, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, the, I mean, this is, this is very important. And, and uh, I was going to say something about technology on this. You know, the, the word technology comes from the Greek. And already there's a declension because techne in Greek doesn't just mean tool as it's sometimes translated. So it's not just the logic of tools or the logos of tools. Techne means craft or practice. And even within the Greek conception, we've lost the, the range of that possibility. Uh, but worse than that, uh, as we've done that, we have made it the case, or it has become the case, that the narrow sense of technology, technologization, uh, has dominated as if it's universal. And this, this really needs uh, thinking through, thinking hard and critically, because it's, uh, it is the, the you know, the circumstance in which we find ourselves. Uh, it, it is the reality. Uh, we are, we are, I'm going to talk about this on Friday too, the cyborgs. We, we have um, enmeshed ourselves, uh, what, we've woven ourselves into a machine reality. And this is, is not necessarily a bad thing, but we need to be very clear in our understanding of what we, what we are doing to ourselves. And maybe tap into more critical and radical possibilities than the ones that simply serve the norms of, of the, the currently dominant discourse. Any more questions? It's a heavy, little heavy, sorry. Well, if there are no more questions, uh, I, I think I find it appropriate to read a, a short fragment from, from one of your essays. Because it somehow has to do with, with, uh, with many things that we, we mentioned in our conversation tonight. It is a notable irony that philosophy is both the only remaining academic discipline that has love in its name. And as an academic discipline, probably the last place any of us would be likely to seek insight into the nature of love. <laughs> the reasons for this are obvious. According to a widely held view of the species, Philosophers have not had much time for the emotions, nor been able to cultivate them very successfully, being in the popular imagination and sometimes also their own, dead from the neck down. <laughs> I, I hope I'm not one of them. <laughs> no, no, that is what I wanted to say. Yeah. You, you, you are very much alive, so. Right. And still in that passion. It was, it was our pleasure to, to, to have you here. And, um, I'm just happy that, that you accepted our invitation and, and uh, came from from um, big 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 cities and busy life of Toronto and, and, and to all the things that you have to do and decided to spend some time with us here in, in, in Buxa. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. Thank you, Stalky. Thank you.